chapter twenty three of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three senator nesmith visits grant sherman reaches the seacoast butler's expedition against fort fisher grant's children at city point upon the return of general ingalls from another trip to washington he brought with him on a visit to city point senator nesmith of oregon who had been an intimate acquaintance of generals grant and ingalls when these two officers were stationed at fort vancouver oregon in eighteen fifty three nesmith was a great wag and used to sit by the headquarters campfire in the evening and tell no end of pacific coast stories by the way in which he elaborated all the incidents and led up with increasing humour to the climax of an anecdote he stamped himself a true artist as a raconteur one evening he told general grant of a trip he had made on the pacific coast with a number of politicians just after his election by the democratic legislature of oregon to the united states senate in the party was the republican governor of california nesmith said the governor got to bedeviling me about my election and rather got the laugh on me by inquiring now nesmith make a clean breast of it and tell us just how much money it costs to get run into the senate by an oregon legislature to strike back at him i replied well i'll give you a little account of my experience in dealing with the boys and leave you to judge i found on counting noses that i had corralled a majority of one certain on joint ballot of the two houses but that didn't make things quite safe and i told my friends that we ought to have still another fellow persuaded of what was due to my eminence as a statesman that it was altogether likely that if we relied on the one man he would be shot or landed in jail or get blind drunk about the time the vote was to be taken and we were playing too big a game to take any such chances well they said there was a man that had recently come into the state from california and had managed to get himself elected to our legislature and they thought from what they had heard of him that he wouldn't be stubborn enough to hold on blindly to the candidate of his choice if argument sufficiently convincing in favor of some one else were laid before him that he was a great fellow to uh, coincide if it was made an object for him to do it you see times were hard and the price of everything was high two years before bibles were given away free and now jackrabbits were selling at two dollars and a half a pair most men's possessions were reduced to a hairbrush and a toothbrush though they never had time to use either i said send the man to my hotel to-night there's no time to be lost i intend to handle this rooster myself when he came to my room i shoved him into a chair locked the door seated myself in front of him folded my arms looked him square in the face and said see here i want your vote how much he glued his eyes on me and remarked now pod you're talking business i don't know just what the state of the market is in oregon but what would you propose as a kind of starter i continued how would a hundred and fifty dollars strike you he rose up out of his chair looking as if he actually felt hurt by my evident lack of appreciation and roared out in a tone of voice calculated to wake the dead a hundred and fifty ells i paid the governor of california twice that much last year to pardon me out of the penitentiary or else i wouldn't be up here in your blank old legislature to vote for anybody we were assured that after the recital of this story which nesbitt had of course invented for the purpose of retaliating upon the california governor there were no further questions from that official as to the methods pursued in oregon elections i wasn't at all surprised nez to see you go to the senate said ingalls i always believed old vancouver could furnish talent enough to supply both the civil and military branches of the government well you may not have been surprised but i was remarked the senator i said to the members of our committee one day when i came here from the wilds of oregon as senator of the united states i couldn't realize it i felt that it was a greater honor than to have been a roman senator i couldn't help wondering how i ever got here well said preston king of new york now that you have been here a couple of weeks and have got the hang of the schoolhouse how do you feel about it my answer was well since i've had time to look round and size things up my wonder now is how in thunder the rest of you fellows ever got here upon this as upon one or two other occasions some stories were attempted which were too broad to suit the taste of the general-in-chief but they were effectually suppressed 
he believed that stories like diamonds are always of greater value when they are not off colour if reference were made to subjects which warred against his notions of propriety while he seldom checked them by words he would show immediately by the blush which mantled his cheek and by his refusal to smile at a joke which depended for its success upon its coarseness that such things were objectionable to him the same evening a citizen who had come to camp with nesmith said he would tell a story and began by looking around significantly and saying i see there are no ladies present the general interrupted him with the remark no but there are gentlemen and the subject was at once changed and the story was not attempted the senator after seeing the lines around petersburg expressed a desire to pay a visit to general butler and engels and i volunteered to take him to that officer's headquarters by boat butler greeted the senator warmly and the two soon began to discuss the war and to banter each other on the subject of politics one being a radical republican and the other a war democrat nesmith drew an amusing picture of butler's propensity for confiscation and destruction of property in the course of the conversation butler referred to some pranks played in his boyish days and said there was a cake peddler who used to come by our schoolhouse every day and during recess we would play cakes with him that is he would set his basket on the ground and a boy by paying twenty-five cents could have the privilege of starting from a certain distance and by a series of designated hops skips and jumps trying to land in the basket and break as many cakes as he could if he succeeded he had a right to take all the cakes he had damaged the game was pretty difficult and the cake man generally came out ahead but one day i strained every nerve to win and succeeded in landing in the middle of the basket with both feet and breaking every cake the fellow had nesmith's comment upon this story was well that's just like you general you seem to have spent all your life in trying to break other people's cakes the joke which had been rather in butler's favour up to that time was now turned against him but he took it all in good part in discussing general grant's popularity butler remarked grant first touched the popular chord when he gained his signal victory at donelson no said nesmith who always went around with a huge joke concealed somewhere about his person i think he first touched the popular chord when he hauled wood from his farm and sold it at full measure in st louis that night nesbitt told general grant the story of the cipher correspondence he and ingalls had carried on the year before he said one day the secretary of war sent me a message that he would like to see me at the war department at the earliest moment on a matter of public importance well i was rather flattered by that i says to myself perhaps the whole southern confederacy is moving on stanton and he has sent for a war democrat to get between him and them and sort of whirl em back i hurried up to his office and when i got in he closed the door looked all around the room like a stage assassin to be sure that we were alone then thrust a telegram under my nose and cried read that i suppose i ought to have appeared scared and tried to find a trap-door in the floor to fall through but i didn't i ran my eye over the dispatch seeing that it was addressed to me and signed by ingles and read clatawada nikata sitkum mutish wait ak stanton who was glaring at me over the top of his spectacles looking as savage as a one-eyed dog in a meat shop now roared out you see i have discovered everything i handed back the dispatch and said well if you've discovered everything what do you want with me he cried i'm determined at all hazards to intercept every cipher dispatch from officers at the front to their friends in the north to enable them to speculate in the stock markets upon early information as to the movements of our armies i said well i can't help but admire your pluck but it seems to me you omitted one little matter you forgot to read the dispatch how can i read your incomprehensible hieroglyphics he replied hieroglyphics thunder i said why that's chinook and what's chinook he asked what you don't know chinook oh i see your early education as a linguist has been neglected i answered why chinook is the court language of the northwestern indian tribes ingalls and i and all the fellows that served out in oregon picked up that jargon now i'll read it to you in english send me half barrel more that same whiskey.' 
you see ingles always trusts my judgment on whisky he thinks i can tell the quality of the liquor by feeling the head of the barrel in the dark that was too much for the great war secretary and he broke out with a laugh such as i don't believe the war department had ever heard since he was appointed to office but i learned afterwards that he took the precaution nevertheless to show the dispatch to an army officer who had served in the northwest to get him to verify my translation as general grant knew a good deal of chinook he was able to appreciate the joke fully and he enjoyed the story greatly nesmith had served to enlighten the camp for several days with his humorous reminiscences of life in the west and when he left every one parted with him with genuine regret on december thirteenth sherman reached osabau sound southeast of savannah just a month after he had left atlanta and communicated with the fleet which had been sent to meet him his sixty five thousand men and half that number of animals had been abundantly fed and his losses had been only a hundred and three killed four hundred and twenty eight wounded and two hundred and seventy eight missing the destruction of the enemy's property has been estimated as high as one hundred millions of dollars on december fifteen general sherman received general grant's letter of the third in this he said among other things not liking to rejoice before the victory is assured i abstain from congratulating you and those under your command until bottom has been struck i have never had a fear of the result the next day sherman received general grant's orders outlining the plan of transferring the greater part of sherman's army by sea to join the armies in front of petersburg and end the war as the enemy's troops were now nearly all in virginia it was thought that as the railroads in the south had been pretty well destroyed it would bring hostilities to a close quicker to move sherman by sea than to consume the time and subject the men to the fatigue of marching by land general grant said this would be the plan unless sherman saw objections to it a prompt and enthusiastic letter was written by sherman saying his army could join grant before the middle of january if sent on transports by sea and that he expected to take savannah meanwhile when general grant visited the capital he consulted as to the means of ocean transportation and became convinced that with all the sea-going vessels that could be procured it would take two months to move sherman's army with its artillery and trains to the james river and he therefore wrote to him from washington i did think the best thing to do was to bring the greater part of your army here and wipe out lee the turn affairs now seem to be taking has shaken me in that opinion i doubt whether you may not accomplish more toward that result where you are than if brought here especially as i am informed since my arrival in the city washington that it would take about two months to get you here with all the other calls there are for ocean transportation i want to get your views about what ought to be done my own opinion is that lee is averse to going out of virginia and if the cause of the south is lost he wants richmond to be the last place surrendered if he has such views it may be well to indulge him until we get everything else in our hands congratulating you and the army again upon the splendid result of your campaign the like of which is not read of in past history i subscribe myself more than ever if possible your friend sherman now invested savannah on the south side but the enemy evacuated the city on the night of december twenty sherman's army then entered and on the twenty second the general sent his famous dispatch to the president which reached him on christmas eve i beg to present you as a christmas gift the city of savannah with a hundred and fifty heavy guns and plenty of ammunition and also about twenty five thousand bales of cotton on december eighth general butler had come over to see general grant at headquarters and said that as his troops would be aboard the transports at fort monroe the next day he would start in the afternoon for that place and see that the expedition was promptly started they had a general conversation in regard to what would be required of the expedition which was merely a reiteration of the written orders which had been carefully prepared it was decided that one of general grant's staff should accompany the expedition and colonel comstock was designated for that duty delay in taking aboard additional supplies and severe storms prevented the expedition from beginning operations against fort fisher before december twenty four the navy had converted a gunboat the louisiana into a powder-boat 
she was filled with two hundred and fifty tons of powder and disguised as a blockade runner this vessel was run in toward the beach anchored about five hundred yards from the fort and exploded about two a m on the twenty fourth the report was not much greater than the discharge of a piece of heavy artillery no damage was done to the enemy's earthworks and no result accomplished a negro on shore was afterward reported to have said when he heard the sound i reckon the yankees have a dumb bust one o da boilers at daylight on the twenty fourth the naval fleet of fifty vessels moved forward and began the bombardment of the fort about noon on the twenty fifth general ames's division landed and a skirmish line was pushed to within a few yards of the fort it was reported that the fort had not been materially damaged and that hoke's command had been sent south from lee's army and was approaching to reinforce the garrison butler now decided not to make an attack and re-embarked all his troops except curtis's brigade on the transports and steamed back to fort monroe reaching there on the twenty seventh curtis's brigade also re-embarked on the twenty seventh and followed the other forces on the twenty eighth general butler came to headquarters and had an interview with general grant in which he sought to explain the causes of the failure general grant expressed himself very positively on the subject he said he considered the whole affair a gross and culpable failure and that he proposed to make it his business to ascertain who was to blame for the want of success the delays from storms were of course unavoidable the preparation of the powder boat had caused a loss of several weeks it was found that the written orders which general grant had given to general butler to govern the movements of the expedition had not been shown to weitzel an important part of these instructions provided that under certain contingencies the troops were expected to entrench and hold themselves in readiness to cooperate with the navy for the reduction of the fort instead of re-embarking on the transports general grant had not positively ordered an assault and would not have censured the commander if the failure to assault had been the only error but he was exceedingly dissatisfied that the important part of his instructions as to gaining and holding an entrenched position had been disobeyed and the troops withdrawn and all further efforts abandoned mrs grant fred and jesse came to city point to spend the christmas holidays with the general rawlins always called fred the veteran for the reason that he had been with his father in the fight which took place in rear of vicksburg the year before when he was only thirteen years of age one evening rawlins said in referring to that campaign fred crossed the mississippi with his father on the gunboat price early in the morning the general went ashore to direct the movement of the troops leaving the boy coiled up on the forward deck fast asleep when he woke up the youngster insisted on following his father but was told by a staff officer to stay where he was and keep out of danger but he happened just then to see some troops chasing a rabbit and jumped ashore and joined in the fun thinking the men were a pretty jolly set of fellows he followed along with the regiment in its march to the front thinking he would meet his father somewhere on the road the troops soon encountered the enemy and fred found himself suddenly participating in the battle of fort gibson that night he recognized a mounted orderly belonging to headquarters and hailed him the orderly gave him a blanket and he rolled himself up in it and managed to get several hours sleep about midnight his father came across him and his surprise may be imagined when he discovered that the boy had left the boat and turned amateur soldier the general had crossed the river in true light marching order for he had no encumbrances but an overcoat and a toothbrush a couple of horses were soon captured the general took one and gave the other to fred they were ungainly ragged hipped nags and the general was greatly amused at seeing the figure the boy cut when mounted on his raw-boned war charger at the battle of black river bridge fred saw lawler's brigade making its famous charge which broke the enemy's line and rode forward and joined in the pursuit of the foe but he had not gone far when a musket ball struck him on the left thigh a staff officer rode up to him and asked him how badly he was hurt and fred not being an expert in gunshot wounds said he rather thought his leg was cut in two can you work your toes asked the officer the boy replied and said he could then cried the officer you're all right and taking him to a surgeon it was found that the ball had only clipped out a little piece of flesh so that he was not damaged enough to have to join the ranks of the disabled 
speaking of the charge of lawler's brigade continued rawlins while the general was watching the preparations for it an officer came up bearing a dispatch from halleck written six days before which had been forwarded through general banks it ordered general grant to withdraw at once from where he was march to grand gulf and cooperate with banks against port hudson and then return with the combined forces and besiege vicksburg the general read the communication and just as he had finished it he saw lawler charging through the enemy's broken lines and heard the men's cheers of victory turning to the officer who had brought the message he said i'll have to say in this case what the irishman said to the chicken that was in the egg he swallowed and which peeped as it was going down his throat you spoke too late then putting spurs to his horse he galloped off to join the advancing lines the enemy's forces were in full retreat hurrying on to shut themselves up in vicksburg and the general under such circumstances had no hesitation in disobeying orders six days old and written without any knowledge of the circumstances soon after fred's arrival at city point he took it into his head that he must go duck shooting the general was no sportsman himself and never shot or fished but he liked to see the youngsters enjoy the christmas holidays and he readily gave his consent to anything they proposed in the way of amusement he never gave a reason for not hunting but it was evident that he felt that certain forms of it furnished a kind of sport which was too cruel to suit his tastes he described the only bullfight he ever attended as presenting a most sickening sight and never seemed to take any pleasure in sports which caused suffering on the part of either animals or human beings as sporting guns are not found among army supplies fred had to content himself with an infantry rifled musket the general's colored servant bill accompanied the boy bill was not much of a shot himself he usually shot as many a man votes with his eyes shut but he was a good hand to take the place of the armor-bearer of the ancients and carry the weapons taking a boat they paddled down the river in search of game they had not gone far when they were brought to by the naval pickets who had been posted on the river bank by the commander of one of the vessels a picket boat was sent after them and they were promptly arrested as rebel spies and taken aboard a gunboat the declaration by the white prisoner who it was supposed was plotting death and destruction to the union that he was the son of the general-in-chief was at first deemed too absurd to be entertained by sailors and fit only to be told to the marines but after a time fred succeeded in convincing the officers as to his identity and was allowed to return to headquarters when he arrived he wore a rueful expression of countenance at the thought of the ingratitude of republics to their veterans his father was greatly amused by the account of his adventure teased him good-naturedly and told him how fortunate it was that he had not been hanged at the yardum as an enemy of the republic and his body consigned to the waters of the potomac End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Campaigning with Grant by Horace Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four Capture of Fort Fisher, the Dutch Gap Canal, Grant receives unasked advice, Grant relieves Butler, Sherman's loyalty to Grant, a good shot, night attack of the enemy's ironclads, how Grant became a confirmed smoker, Grant offers his purse to his enemy grant receives the peace commissioners as soon as general grant obtained accurate information in regard to the circumstances and conditions at fort fisher he decided to send another expedition and to put it in charge of an efficient officer and one who could be trusted implicitly to carry out his instructions as there had been a lack of precaution on the part of the officers engaged in the previous expedition to keep the movement secret the general-in-chief at first communicated the facts regarding the new expedition to only two persons at headquarters of course he had to let it be known to the secretary of war but as the secretary was always reticent about such matters there was a reasonable probability that the secret could be kept directions were given which tended to create the impression that the vessels were being loaded with supplies and reinforcements for sherman's armies and studious efforts were made to throw the enemy off his guard 
of course every one who knew the general's tenacity of purpose felt sure that he would never relinquish his determination to take fort fisher and would immediately take steps to retrieve the failure which had been made in the first attempt and as soon as butler returned i suggested to the general that in case another expedition should be sent general a h terry would be for many reasons the best officer to be placed in command we had served together in the sherman dupont expeditions which in eighteen sixty one took hilton head and captured fort pulaski and other points on the atlantic coast and i knew him to be the most experienced officer in the service in embarking and disembarking troops upon the sea coast looking after their welfare on transports and entrenching rapidly on shore general grant had seldom come in contact with terry personally but had been much impressed at the manner in which he had handled his troops in the movements on the james river a suggestion too was made that as terry was a volunteer officer and as the first expedition had failed under a volunteer it would only be fair that another officer of that service rather than one from the regular army should be given a chance to redeem the disaster the general seemed to listen with interest to what was said about terry particularly as to his experience in sea-coast expeditions but gave no hint at the time of a disposition to appoint him nor did he even say whether he would send another expedition to fort fisher but on january two he telegraphed to butler please send major-general terry to city point to see me this morning grant considered the propriety of going in person with the expedition but his better judgment did not approve such a course for he could be too far out of reach of communication with city point and as butler was the senior army commander it would leave him in supreme command of the armies operating against petersburg and richmond when terry came the general-in-chief told him simply that he had been designated to take command of a transfer by sea of eight thousand men and that he was to sail under sealed orders terry felt much complimented that he should be singled out for such a command but had no idea of his destination and was evidently under the impression that he was to join sherman on january five terry was ready to proceed to fort monroe and grant accompanied him down the james river for the purpose of giving him his final instructions after the boat had proceeded some distance from city point the general sat down with terry in the after cabin of the steamer and there made known to him the real destination and purposes of the expedition he said the object is to renew the attempt to capture fort fisher and in case of success to take possession of wilmington it is of the greatest importance that there should be a complete understanding and harmony of action between you and admiral porter i want you to consult the admiral fully and to let there be no misunderstanding in regard to the plan of cooperation in all its details i served with admiral porter on the mississippi and have a high appreciation of his courage and judgment i want to urge upon you to land with all dispatch and entrench yourself in a position from which you can operate against fort fisher and not to abandon it until the fort is captured or you receive further instructions from me full instructions were carefully prepared in writing and handed to terry on the evening of january five and captains of the transports were given sealed orders not to be opened until the vessels were off cape henry the vessel soon appeared off the north carolina coast a landing was made on january thirteen and on the morning of the fourteenth terry had fortified a position about two miles from the fort the navy which had been firing upon the fort for two days began another bombardment at daylight on the fifteenth that afternoon ames's division made an assault on the work two thousand sailors and marines were also landed for the purpose of making a charge they had received an order from the admiral in the wording of which facetiousness in nautical phraseology could go no further it read board the ford in a seaman-like manner they made a gallant attack but were met with a murderous fire and did not gain the work ames's division with curtis's brigade in advance overcame all efforts of the defenders and the garrison was driven from one portion of the fort to another in a series of hand-to-hand -hand contests in which individual acts of heroism surpassed almost anything in the history of assaults upon well-defended forts the battle did not close until ten o'clock at night then the formidable work had been fairly won 
the garrison was taken prisoners the mouth of the cape fear river was closed and wilmington was at the mercy of our troops the trophies were a hundred and sixty-nine guns over two thousand stands of small arms large quantities of ammunition and commissary stores and more than two thousand prisoners about six hundred of the garrison were killed or wounded terry's loss was a hundred and ten killed five hundred and thirty six wounded and thirteen missing after the news of the capture of the fort was received i was sent there by general grant with additional instructions to terry and upon my arrival i could not help being surprised at the formidable character of the work no one without having seen it could form an adequate conception of the almost insurmountable obstacles which the assaulting columns encountered during the summer general butler who was always fertile in ideas had conceived the notion that there were many advantages to be gained by making a canal across a narrow neck of land known as dutch gap on the james river which would cut off four and three-quarter miles of river navigation this neck was about one hundred and seventy-four yards wide the name originated from the fact that a dutchman had many years before attempted a similar undertaking but little or no progress had been made the enterprise involved the excavation of nearly eighty thousand cubic feet of earth butler had been somewhat reluctantly authorized to dig the canal and work upon it had begun on august ten the enemy soon erected heavy rifle guns and afterward put mortars in positions which bore upon it and our men were subjected to a severe fire and frequently had to seek shelter in dugouts constructed as places of refuge under the delays and difficulties which arose the canal was not finished until the end of the year on the thirty first of december general grant received a message from butler saying we propose to explode the heading of dutch gap at eleven a m tomorrow i should be happy to see yourself and friends at headquarters we must be near the time because of the tide the general-in-chief replied do not wait for me in your explosion i doubt my ability to be up in the morning after the bulkhead wall of earth had been blown out the debris at the north end was partly removed by means of steam dredges the canal was not of any service during the war but it has since been enlarged and improved and has become the ordinary channel for the passage of vessels plying on the james river general grant had become very tired of discussing methods of warfare which were like some of the problems described in algebra as more curious than useful and he was not sufficiently interested in the canal to be present at the explosion which was expected to complete it about this time all the cranks in the country besides men of real inventive genius were sending extraordinary plans and suggestions for capturing richmond a proposition from an engineer was received one day accompanied by elaborate drawings and calculations which had evidently involved intense labor on the part of the author his plan was to build a masonry wall around richmond of an elevation higher than the tallest houses then to fill the enclosure with water pumped from the james river and drown out the garrison and people like rats in a cage the exact number of pumps required and their capacity had been figured out to a nicety another inventive genius whose mind seemed to run in the direction of the science of chemistry and the practice of sternutation sent in a chemical formula for making an all-powerful snuff in his communication he assured the commanding general that after a series of experiments he had made with it on people and animals he was sure that if shells were filled with it and exploded within the enemy's lines the troops would be seized with such violent fits of sneezing that they would soon become physically exhausted with the effort and the union army could walk over at its leisure and pick them up as prisoners without itself losing a man a certain officer had figured out from statistics that the james river froze over about once in seven years and that this was the seventh year and advised that troops be massed in such a position that when the upper part of the james changed from a liquid to a solid columns could be rushed across it on the ice to a position in rear of the enemy's lines and richmond would be at our mercy a sorcerer in rochester sent the general word that he had cast his horoscope and gave him a clear and unclouded insight into his future and added to its general attractiveness by telling him how gloriously he was going to succeed in taking richmond 
one evening the general referred to these emanations of the prolific brains of our people and the many novel suggestions made to him beginning with the famous powder boat sent against fort fisher and closed the conversation by saying this is a very suggestive age some people seem to think that an army can be whipped by waiting for rivers to freeze over exploding powder at a distance drowning out troops or setting them to sneezing but it will always be found in the end that the only way to whip an army is to go out and fight it on january four general grant had written to the secretary of war asking that butler might be relieved saying i am constrained to request the removal of general butler from the command of the department of virginia and north carolina i do this with reluctance but the good of the service requires it in my absence general butler necessarily commands and there is a lack of confidence felt in his military ability making him an unsafe commander for a large army his administration of the affairs of his department is also objectionable learning that the secretary of war had gone to savannah to visit general sherman and could not receive this letter in due time on january sixth the general telegraphed to the president asking that prompt action be taken in the matter the order was made on the seventh and on the morning of the eighth general grant directed colonel babcock and me to go to general butler's headquarters announce the fact to him and hand him the written order relieving him from command we arrived there about noon found the general in his camp and by his invitation went with him into his tent he opened the communication read the order and was silent for a minute then he began to manifest considerable nervousness and turning to his desk wrote received on the envelope dated it eighteen sixty four instead of eighteen sixty five and handed it back it was the custom in the army to return envelope receipts in case of communications delivered by enlisted men but this was omitted when the instructions were transmitted by staff officers he was politely reminded that a written receipt was not necessary thereupon in a somewhat confused manner he uttered a word or two of apology for offering it and after a slight pause added please say to general grant that i will go to his headquarters and would like to have a personal interview with him general grant was in constant correspondence with sherman in regard to the movements in the carolinas sherman was to move north breaking up all lines of communication as he advanced if lee should suddenly abandon richmond and petersburg and move with his army to join the confederate forces in the carolinas with a view to crushing sherman that officer was to whip lee if he could and if not to fall back upon the sea-coast grant was to hold lee's army where it was if possible and if not to follow it up with vigor sherman's triumphant march to the sea had gained him many admirers in the north and it was believed about this time that a bill might be introduced in congress providing for his promotion to the grade of lieutenant-general which would make him eligible to command the armies in case he should be assigned to such a position on january twenty one he said in a letter to general grant i have been told that congress meditates a bill to make another lieutenant-general for me i have written to john sherman to stop it if it is designed for me it would be mischievous for there are enough rascals who would try to sow differences between us whereas you and i now are in perfect understanding i would rather have you in command than anybody else for you are fair honest and have at heart the same purpose that should animate all i should emphatically decline any commission calculated to bring us into rivalry general grant replied no one would be more pleased at your advancement than i and if you should be placed in my position and i put subordinate it would not change our relations in the least i would make the same exertions to support you that you have ever done to support me and i would do all in my power to make our cause win on january thirty one sherman wrote i am fully aware of your friendly feeling toward me and you may always depend on me as your steadfast supporter your wish is law and gospel to me and such is the feeling that pervades my army in all the annals of history no correspondence between men in high station furnishes a nobler example of genuine disinterested personal friendship and exalted loyalty to a great cause admiral porter had withdrawn nearly all the naval vessels from the james river in order to increase his fleet for the fort fisher expedition 
only three or four light gunboats were left and one ironclad the onondaga a powerful double turreted monitor carrying two fifteen-inch smooth bores and two one hundred and fifty pound parrot rifles this vessel was commanded by captain william a parker of the navy captain parker would occasionally pay a visit to general grant at city point and he usually brought with him a junior officer who afforded the general-in-chief no little amusement by the volubility of his conversation when the general asked the captain a question before he could venture a reply his sub would volunteer an answer and frequently make it the occasion of an elaborate lecture upon the intricate science of marine warfare the captain could rarely get in a word edgewise in fact he seemed to accept the situation and did not often make the attempt it might have been said of this young officer what talleyrand said of a french diplomat clever man but he has no talent for dialogue there had been so much talk about the formidable character of the double turreted monitors that general grant decided one morning to go up the james and pay a visit to the onondaga and invite me to accompany him the monitor was lying above the pontoon bridge in trent's reach after looking the vessel over and admiring the perfection of her machinery the general said to the commander captain what is the effective range of your fifteen-inch smooth bores about eighteen hundred yards with their present elevation was the reply the general looked up the river and added there is a battery which is just about that distance from us suppose you take a shot at it and see what you can do the gun was promptly brought into position by revolving the turret accurate aim taken and the order given to fire there was a tremendous concussion followed by a deafening roar as the enormous shell passed through the air and then all eyes were strained to see what execution would be done by the shot the huge mass struck directly within the battery and exploded a cloud of smoke arose earth and splintered logs flew in every direction and a number of the garrison sprang over the parapet the general took another puff at the cigar he was smoking nodded his head and said good shot the naval officers indulged in broad smiles of triumph and tried to look as if this was only one of the little things they always did with equal success when they tried hard on the night of january twenty three a naval officer at general grant's suggestion was sent up to plant torpedoes at the obstructions which had been placed in the river at trent's reach as he was apprehensive that our depleted naval force might be attacked by the enemy's fleet which was lying in the river near richmond the officer made the discovery that the confederate ironclads were quietly moving down the river news of their approach was promptly given and at once telegraphed to headquarters the enemy's fleet consisted of six vessels and by half past ten o'clock they had passed the upper end of dutch gap canal the general directed me and another staff officer to take boats and communicate with all dispatch with certain naval vessels warn them of the character of the anticipated attack and direct them to move up and make a determined effort to prevent the enemy's fleet from reaching city point the officer whom i was to take with me got a little rattled in the hurry of the departure and started from force of habit to put on his spurs it took me some time to persuade him that these appendages to his seals would not particularly facilitate his movements in climbing aboard gunboats a third officer lieutenant dunn was sent to communicate with a gunboat stationed at some distance from the others in the meantime orders were given to tow coal schooners up the river ready to sink them in the channel if necessary and instructions were issued to move all heavy guns within reach down to the river shore where their fire could command the channel there was an enormous accumulation of supplies at city point and their destruction at this time would have been a serious embarrassment the night was pitch dark but our naval vessels were promptly reached by means of steam tugs and their commanders who displayed that cordial spirit of cooperation always manifested by our sister service expressed an eagerness to obey general grant's orders as implicitly as if he had been their admiral most of these vessels were out of repair and almost unserviceable but their officers were determined to make the best fight they could when i returned to headquarters the general mrs grant and ingalls were talking the matter over in the front room of the general's quarters well now that we've got all ready for them said ingalls why don't their old gunboats come down 
ingles you must have patience remarked the general perhaps they don't know that you're in such a hurry for them or they would move faster you must give them time well if they're going to postpone their movement indefinitely i'll go to bed continued ingles and started for his quarters news now came that it was thought the vessels could not pass the obstructions and would not make the attempt and the general and mrs grant retired to their sleeping apartment orders being left that the general was to be awakened if there should be any change in the situation soon after one o'clock word came that the enemy's vessels had succeeded at high water in getting through the obstructions a loud knock was now given upon the door of the general's sleeping-room he called out instantly yes what have you heard the reply was the gunboats have passed the obstructions and are coming down in about two minutes the general came hurriedly into the office he had drawn on his top boots over his drawers and put on his uniform frock coat the skirt of which reached about to the top of the boots and made up for the absence of trousers he lighted a cigar while listening to the reports and then sat down at his desk and wrote out orders in great haste the puffs from the cigar were now as rapid as those of the engine of an express train at full speed mrs grant soon after came in and was anxious to know about the situation it was certainly an occasion upon which a woman's curiosity was entirely justifiable dunn had returned with a report about the movement of the gunboat with which he had been sent to communicate and ingles had also rejoined the party mrs grant in the midst of the scene quietly said ulyss will those gunboats shell the bluff well i think all their time will be occupied in fighting our naval vessels and the batteries ashore he replied the onondaga ought to be able to sink them but i don't know what they would do if they should get down this far just then news came in that upon the approach of the enemy's vessels the onondaga had retired down the river the captain had lost his head and under pretense of trying to obtain a more advantageous position had turned tail with his vessel and moved down stream below the pontoon bridge general grant's indignation knew no bounds when he heard of this retreat he said i have been thrown into close contact with the navy both on the mississippi river and upon the atlantic coast i entertain the highest regard for the intrepidity of the officers of that service and it is an inexpressible mortification to think that the captain of so formidable an ironclad and the only one of its kind we have in the river should fall back at such a critical moment why it was the great chance of his life to distinguish himself additional instructions were at once telegraphed to the shore batteries to act with all possible vigor mrs grant who was one of the most composed of those present now drew her chair a little nearer to the general and with her mild voice inquired ulyss what had i better do the general looked at her for a moment and then replied in a half serious and half teasing way well the fact is julia you oughtn't to be here dunn now spoke up and said let me have the ambulance hitched up and drive mrs grant back into the country far enough to be out of reach of the shells oh their gunboats are not down here yet answered the general and they must be stopped at all hazards additional dispatches were sent and a fresh cigar was smoked the puffs of which showed even an increased rapidity at about two hours it was reported that only one of the enemy's boats was below the obstructions and the rest were above apparently aground more guns had by this time been placed in the shore batteries and the situation was greatly relieved ingles whose dry humor always came to his rescue when matters were serious again assumed an air of disappointment and said i tell you i'm getting out of all patience and i've about made up my mind that these boats never intended to come down here anyhow that they've been playing it on us to keep us out of bed a little while after matters had to be so quieted down that the general-in-chief and mrs grant retired to finish their interrupted sleep at daylight the onondaga moved up within nine hundred yards of the confederate ironclad virginia the flagship and opened fire upon her some of the shore guns were also trained upon her and a general pounding began she was struck about one hundred and thirty times our fifteen-inch shells doing much damage another vessel the richmond was struck a number of times and a third the drury and a torpedo launch were destroyed at flood tide the enemy succeeded in getting their vessels afloat and withdrew up the river 
that night they came down again and attacked the onondaga but retired after meeting with a disastrous fire from that vessel and our batteries on the river banks this was the last service performed by the enemy's fleet in the james river on the morning of january twenty four breakfast in the mess-room was a little later than usual as every one had been trying to make up for the sleep lost the previous night when the chief had lighted his cigar after the morning meal and taken his place by the camp-fire a staff officer said general i never saw cigars consumed quite so rapidly as those you smoked last night when you were writing dispatches to head off the ironclads he smiled and remarked no when i come to think of it those cigars didn't last very long did they an allusion was then made to the large numbers he had smoked the second day of the battle of the wilderness in reply to this he said i had been a very light smoker previous to the attack on donelson and after that battle i acquired a fondness for cigars by reason of a purely accidental circumstance admiral foote commanding the fleet of gunboats which were cooperating with the army had been wounded and at his request i had gone aboard his flagship to confer with him the admiral offered me a cigar which i smoked on my way back to my headquarters on the road i was met by a staff officer who announced that the enemy were making a vigorous attack i galloped forward at once and while riding among the troops giving directions for repulsing the assault i carried the cigar in my hand it had gone out but it seems that i continued to hold the stump between my fingers throughout the battle in the accounts published in the papers i was represented as smoking a cigar in the midst of the conflict and many persons thinking no doubt that tobacco was my chief solace sent me boxes of the choicest brands from everywhere in the north as many as ten thousand were soon received i gave away all i could get rid of but having such a quantity on hand i naturally smoked more than i would have done under ordinary circumstances and i have continued the habit ever since general grant never mentioned however one incident in connection with the battle of donelson and no one ever heard of it until it was related by his opponent in that battle general buckner in a speech made by that officer at a banquet given in new york on the anniversary of general grant's birthday april twenty seventh eighteen eighty nine he said under these circumstances sir i surrendered to general grant i had at a previous time befriended him and it has been justly said that he never forgot an act of kindness i met him on the boat and he followed me when i went to my quarters he left the officers of his own army and followed me with that modest manner peculiar to himself into the shadow and there tendered me his purse it seems to me mr chairman that in the modesty of his nature he was afraid the light would witness that act of generosity and sought to hide it from the world we can appreciate that sir on the morning of the thirty first of january general grant received a letter sent in on the petersburg front the day before signed by the confederates alexander h stevens j a campbell and r m t hunter asking permission to come through our lines these gentlemen constituted the celebrated peace commission and were on their way to endeavor to have a conference with mr lincoln the desired permission to enter our lines was granted and babcock was sent to meet them and escort them to city point some time after dark the train which brought them arrived and they came at once to headquarters general grant was writing in his quarters when a knock came upon the door in obedience to his come in the party entered and were most cordially received and a very pleasant conversation followed stevens was the vice-president of the confederacy campbell a former justice of the supreme court of the united states was assistant secretary of war and hunter was president pro tempore of the confederate senate as general grant had been instructed from washington to keep them at city point until further orders he conducted them in person to the headquarters steamer the mary martin which was lying at the wharf made them his guests and had them provided with well-furnished staterooms and comfortable meals during their stay they were treated with every possible courtesy their movements were not restrained and they passed part of the time upon the boat and part of it at headquarters stevens was about five feet five inches in height his complexion was sallow and his skin seemed shrivelled upon his bones he possessed intellect enough however for the whole commission 
many pleasant conversations occurred with him at headquarters and an officer once remarked after the close of an interview the lord seems to have robbed that man's body of nearly all its flesh and blood to make brains of them the commissioners twice endeavored to draw general grant out as to his ideas touching the proper conditions of the proposed terms of peace but as he considered himself purely a soldier not entrusted with any diplomatic functions and as the commissioners spoke of negotiations between the two governments while the general was not willing to acknowledge even by an inference any government within our borders except that of the united states he avoided the subject entirely except to let it be known by his remarks that he would gladly welcome peace if it could be secured upon proper terms mr lincoln had directed mr seward the secretary of state on january thirty one to meet the commissioners at fort monroe on february two general grant telegraphed the president that he thought the gentlemen were sincere in their desire to restore peace and union and that it would have a bad effect if they went back without any expression from one who was in authority and said he would feel sorry if mr lincoln did not have an interview with them or with some of them this changed the president's mind and he started at once for fort monroe the commissioners were sent down the james river that afternoon and were met at fort monroe by the president and mr seward on the third and had a conference lasting several hours aboard the president's steamer mr lincoln stated that peace could be secured only by a restoration of the national authority over all the states a recognition of the position assumed by him as to the abolition of slavery and an understanding that there should be no cessation of hostilities short of an end of the war and a disbanding of all forces hostile to the government the commissioners while they did not declare positively that they would not consent to reunion avoided giving their assent and as they seemed to desire to postpone that important question and to adopt some other course first which might possibly lead in the end to union but which mr lincoln and mr seward thought would amount simply to an indefinite postponement the conference ended without result after stopping at city point and having another conversation with general grant principally in reference to an exchange of prisoners the confederate commissioners were escorted through our lines on their way back to richmond i accompanied the escort part of the way and had an interesting talk with mr stevens he was evidently greatly disappointed at the failure of the conference but was prudent enough not to talk much about it he spoke freely in regard to general grant saying we all form our preconceived ideas of men of whom we have heard a great deal and i had certain definite notions as to the appearance and character of general grant but i was never so completely surprised in all my life as when i met him and found him a person so entirely different from my idea of him his spare figure simple manners lack of all ostentation extreme politeness and charm of conversation were a revelation to me for i had pictured him as a man of a directly opposite type of character and expected to find in him only the bluntness of the soldier notwithstanding the fact that he talks so well it is plain that he has more brains than tongue he continued by saying what he said several times in washington after the war and also wrote in his memoirs he is one of the most remarkable men i ever met he does not seem to be aware of his powers but in the future he will undoubtedly exert a controlling influence in shaping the destinies of the country mr stevens was wrapped from his eyes to his heels in a coarse gray overcoat about three sizes too large for him with a collar so high that it threatened to lift his hat off every time he leaned his head back this coat together with his complexion which was as yellow as a ripe ear of corn gave rise to a characterization of the costume by mr lincoln which was very amusing the next time he saw general grant at city point after the peace conference he said to him in speaking on the subject did you see stevenson's great coat oh yes answered the general well continued mr lincoln soon after we assembled on the steamer at hampton roads the cabin began to get pretty warm and stephen stood up and pulled off his big coat he peeled it off just about as you would husk an ear of corn i couldn't help thinking as i looked first at the coat and then at the man well that's the biggest shuck and the littlest nubbin i ever did see this story became one of the general's favorite anecdotes and he often related it in after years with the greatest zest End of chapter twenty four
chapter twenty five of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five grant plans the spring campaigns the president's son joins grant's staff lee asks a personal interview a visionary peace program high prices in richmond grant receives a medal from congress shaving under difficulties arrival of sheridan's scouts general grant was at this time employing all his energies in maturing his plans for a comprehensive campaign on the part of all the armies with a view to ending the war in the early spring sheridan was to move down the valley of virginia for the purpose of destroying the railroads the james river canal and the factories in that section of country used for the production of munitions of war stoneman was to start upon a raid from east tennessee with four thousand men with a view to breaking up the enemy's communications in that direction canby who was in command at new orleans was to advance against mobile montgomery and selma in the movement on mobile canby had at least forty five thousand men thomas was to send a large body of cavalry under wilson into alabama the movements of our forces in the west were intended not only to destroy communications but to keep the confederate troops there from being sent east to operate against sherman sherman was to march to columbia south carolina thence to fayetteville north carolina and afterward in the direction of goldsboro schofield was to be transferred from tennessee to annapolis maryland and thence by steamer to the cape fear river for the purpose of moving inland from there and joining sherman in north carolina schofield's orders were afterward changed and he rendezvoused at alexandria virginia instead of annapolis the army of the potomac and the army of the james were to watch lee and at the proper time strike his army a crushing blow or if he should suddenly retreat to pursue him and inflict upon him all damage possible and to endeavor to head off and prevent any portion of his army from reaching north carolina as an organized force capable of forming a junction with johnston and opposing sherman some of these operations were delayed longer than was expected and a few changes were made in the original plan but they were all carried into effect with entire success and the military ability of the general-in-chief never appeared to better advantage than in directing these masterly movements which covered a theatre of war greater than that of any campaigns in modern history and which required a grasp and comprehension which have rarely been possessed even by the greatest commanders he was at this period indefatigable in his labors and he once wrote in a single day forty-two important dispatches with his own hand in the latter part of january general grant went with schofield down the coast and remained there a short time to give personal directions on the ground sherman entered columbia february seventeenth and the garrison of charleston evacuated that place on the eighteenth without waiting to be attacked when this news was received dr craven a medical officer who was in the habit of drawing all his similes from his own profession commended the movement by saying general sherman applied a remedial agency which is in entire accord with the best medical practice charleston was suffering from the disease known as secession and he got control of it by means of counter irritation wilmington was captured on the twenty second of february an addition was now made to our staff in the person of captain robert t lincoln the president's eldest son he had been graduated at harvard university in eighteen sixty four and had at once urged his father to let him enter the army and go to the front but mr lincoln felt that this would only add to his own personal anxieties and robert was persuaded to remain at harvard and take a course of study in the law school the fact is not generally known that mr lincoln already had a personal representative in the army he had procured a man to enlist early in the war whom he always referred to as his substitute this soldier served in the field to the end with a good record and the president watched his course with great interest and took no little pride in him in the spring of eighteen sixty five robert renewed his request to his father who mentioned the subject to general grant the general said to the president that if he would let robert join the staff at headquarters he would be glad to give him a chance to see some active service in the field 
the president replied that he would consent to this upon one condition that his son should serve as a volunteer aide without pay or emoluments but grant dissuaded him from adhering to that determination saying that it was due to the young man that he should be regularly commissioned and put on an equal footing with other officers of the same grade so it was finally settled that robert should receive the rank of captain and assistant adjutant general and on february twenty three he was attached to the staff of the general-in-chief the new acquisition to the company at headquarters soon became exceedingly popular he had inherited many of the genial traits of his father and entered heartily into all the social pastimes at headquarters he was always ready to perform his share of hard work and never expected to be treated differently from any other officer on account of his being the son of the chief executive of the nation the experience acquired by him in the field did much to fit him for the position of secretary of war which he afterward held this month had brought me another promotion i received a commission as brevet colonel of volunteers dated february twenty four for faithful and meritorious services on the evening of march three just as the general was starting to the mess hut for dinner a communication was handed to him from general lee which had come through our lines and was dated the day before after referring to a recent meeting under a flag of truce between ord and longstreet from which the impression was derived that general grant would not refuse to see him if he had authority to act for the purpose of attempting to bring about an adjustment of the present difficulties by means of a military convention the letter went on to say sincerely desiring to leave nothing untried which may put an end to the calamities of war i propose to meet you at such convenient time and place as you may designate with the hope that upon an interchange of views it may be found practicable to submit the subjects of controversy between the belligerents to a convention of the kind mentioned in such event i am authorized to do whatever the result of the proposed interview may render necessary or advisable there came enclosed with this letter another stating that general lee feared there was some misunderstanding about the exchange of political prisoners and saying that he hoped that at the interview proposed some satisfactory solution of that matter might be arrived at general grant not being vested with any authority whatever to treat for peace at once telegraphed the contents of the communication to the secretary of war and asked for instructions the dispatch was submitted to mr lincoln at the capitol where he had gone according to the usual custom at the closing hours of the session of congress in order to act promptly upon bills presented to him he consulted with the secretaries of state and war and then wrote with his own hand a reply dated midnight which was signed by stanton and forwarded to general grant it was received the morning of the fourth and read as follows the president directs me to say to you that he wishes you to have no conference with general lee unless it be for the capitulation of general lee's army or on some minor and purely military matter he instructs me to say that you are not to decide discuss or confer upon any political question such questions the president holds in his own hands and will submit them to no military conferences or conventions meantime you are to press to the utmost your military advantages the general thought that the president was unduly anxious about the manner in which the affair would be treated and replied at once i can assure you that no act of the enemy will prevent me from pressing all advantages gained to the utmost of my ability neither will i under any circumstances exceed my authority or in any way embarrass the government it was because i had no right to meet general lee on the subject proposed by him that i referred the matter for instructions he then replied to lee in regard to meeting you on the sixth instant i would state that i have no authority to accede to your proposition for a conference on the subject proposed such authority is vested in the president of the united states alone general ord could only have meant that i would not refuse an interview on any subject on which i have a right to act which of course would be such as are purely of a military character and on the subject of exchanges which has been entrusted to me it was learned afterward that an interesting but rather fanciful program had been laid out by the enemy as a means to be used in restoring peace 
and that this contemplated interview between grant and lee was to be the opening feature jefferson davis had lost the confidence of his people to such an extent as a director of military movements that lee had been made generalissimo and given almost dictatorial powers as to war measures as the civilians had failed to bring about peace it was resolved to put lee forward in an effort to secure it upon some terms which the south could accept without too great a sacrifice of its dignity by means of negotiations which were to begin by a personal interview with general grant one proposition discussed was that after the meeting of grant and lee at which peace should be urged upon terms of granting amnesty making some compensation for the emancipated slaves etc by the national government it should be arranged to have mrs longstreet who had been an old friend of mrs grant visit her at city point and after that to try and induce mrs grant to visit richmond it was taken for granted that the natural chivalry of the soldiers would assure such cordial and enthusiastic greetings to these ladies that it would arouse a general sentiment of good will which would everywhere lead to demonstrations in favor of peace between the two sections of the country general longstreet says that the project went so far that mrs longstreet who was at lynchburg was telegraphed to come on to richmond the plan outlined in this order of procedure was so visionary that it seemed strange that it could ever have been seriously discussed by any one but it must be remembered that the condition of the confederacy was then desperate and that drowning men catch at straws it was seen that grant by his operations was rapidly forcing the fight to a finish the last white man in the south had been put into the ranks the communications were broken the supplies were irregular confederate money was at a fabulous discount and hope had given place to despair the next evening one of our scouts returned from a trip to richmond and was brought to headquarters in order that the general-in-chief might question him in person the man said the depreciation in the purchasing power of graybacks as we call the rebel treasury notes is so rapid that every time i go into the enemy's lines i have to increase my supply of them on my last trip i had to stuff my clothes full of their currency to keep myself going for even a couple of days a barrel of flour in richmond now costs over a thousand dollars and a suit of clothes about twelve hundred a dollar in gold is equal in value to a hundred dollars in graybacks then so much counterfeit confederate money has been shoved in through our lines that in the country places they don't pretend to make any difference between good and bad money a fellow that had come in from the western part of the state told me a pretty tough yarn about matters out there he said everything that has a picture on it goes for money if you stop at a hotel and the bill of fare happens to have an engraving of the house printed at the top you can just tear off the picture and pay for your dinner with it on the tenth of march the hon elihu b washburn who had paid one or two visits before to headquarters arrived at city point and brought with him the medal which had been struck in accordance with an act of congress in recognition of general grant's services of which mr washburn had been commissioned to present a dozen prominent ladies and gentlemen from washington came at the same time on the afternoon of the next day general grant went with them to the lines of the army of the potomac and gave orders for a review of some of the troops that evening some simple arrangements were made for the presentation of the medal which took place at eight p m in the main cabin of the steamer which had brought the visitors and which was lying at the city point wharf general meade suggested that he and the corps commanders would like to witness the ceremony and in response to an invitation they came to city point for the purpose accompanied by a large number of their staff officers mr washburn arose at the appointed hour and after delivering an exceedingly graceful speech eulogistic of the illustrious services for which congress had awarded this testimonial of the nation's gratitude and appreciation he took the medal from the handsome morocco case in which it was enclosed and handed it to the general-in-chief the general who had remained standing during the presentation speech with his right hand clasping the lapel of his coat received the medal and expressed his appreciation of the gift in a few well-chosen words but uttered with such modesty of manner and in so low a tone of voice that they were scarcely audible
a military band was in attendance and at the suggestion of mrs grant a dance was now improvised the officers soon selected their partners from among the ladies present and the evening's entertainment was continued to a late hour the general was urged to indulge in a waltz but from this he begged off however he finally agreed to compromise the matter by dancing a square dance he went through the cotillion not as gracefully as some of the beaux among the younger officers present but did his part exceedingly well barring the impossibility of his being able to keep exact time with the music he did not consider dancing his forte and in after life seldom indulged in that form of amusement unless upon some occasion when he attended a ball given in his honour in such case he felt that he had to take part in the opening dance to avoid appearing impolite or unappreciative mr washburn was assigned quarters in camp next to general grant the next day was sunday the congressman was the first one up and when he went to shave he found there was no looking-glass in his quarters so he stepped across to the general's office in his shirt-sleeves and finding a glass there proceeded to lather his face and prepare for the delicate operation of removing his beard just as he had taken hold of his nose with his left thumb and forefinger which he had converted into a sort of clothespin for the occasion and had scraped a wide swath down his right cheek with the razor the front door of the hut was suddenly burst open and a young woman rushed in fell on her knees at his feet and cried save him oh save him he's my husband the distinguished member of congress was so startled by the sudden apparition that it was with difficulty that he avoided disfiguring his face with a large gash he turned to the intruder and said what's all this about your husband come get up get up i don't understand you oh general for god's sake do save my husband continued the woman why my good woman i'm not general grant the congressman insisted yes you are they told me this was your room oh save him general they're to shoot him this very day for desertion if you don't stop them mr washburn now began to take in the situation and led the woman to a seat and tried to comfort her while she began to tell how her young husband had been led through his fondness for her to desert in order to go home and see her and how he had been captured and court-martialed and was to be executed that day and how she had heard of it only in time to reach headquarters that morning to plead for his life by this time the general was up and hearing from his sleeping apartment an excited conversation in the front room dressed hurriedly and stepped upon the scene in time to hear the burden of the woman's story the spectacle presented partook decidedly of the serio comic the dignified member of congress was standing in his shirt-sleeves in front of the pleading woman his face covered with lather except the swath which had been made down his right cheek the razor was uplifted in his hand and the tears were starting out of his eyes as his sympathies began to be worked upon the woman was screaming and gesticulating frantically and was almost hysterical with grief i appeared at the front door about the same time that the general entered from the rear and it was hard to tell whether one ought to laugh or cry at the sight presented the general now took a hand in the matter convinced the woman that he was the commanding general assured her that he would take steps at once to have her husband reprieved and pardoned and sent her away rejoicing his interposition saved the man's life just in the nick of time he cracked many a joke with mr washburn afterward about the figure he cut on the morning of the occurrence sheridan had started out from winchester on the twenty seventh of february with nearly ten thousand cavalry on march five news was received that he had struck early's forces between staunton and charlottesville and crushed his entire command compelling early and other officers to take refuge in houses and in the woods for some time thereafter only contradictory reports were heard from sheridan through the richmond papers which came into our hands and as he was in the heart of the enemy's country and direct communication was cut off it was difficult to ascertain the facts general grant felt no apprehension as to the result of sheridan's movements but was anxious to get definite reports on sunday evening march twelve the members of the mess sat down to dinner about dark mrs grant and mrs rawlins who was also visiting headquarters were at the table 
toward the end of the meal the conversation turned upon sheridan and all present expressed the hope that we might soon hear something from him in regard to the progress of his movements just then a colored waiter stepped rapidly into the mess-room and said to the general thar's a man outside to say he want to see you right away and he don't appear to want to see nobody else what kind of looking man is he asked the general why said the servant he's de most dreadful lookin bein i ever laid eyes on it appears to me like it was an outcast with the general's consent i left the table and went to see who the person was i found a man outside who was about to sink to the ground from exhaustion and who had scarcely strength enough to reply to my questions he had on a pair of soldier's trousers three or four inches too short and a blouse three sizes too large he was without a hat and his appearance was grotesque in the extreme with him was another man in about the same condition after giving them some whiskey they gathered strength enough to state that they were scouts sent by sheridan from columbia on the james river had passed through the enemy's line bringing with them a long and important dispatch from their commander had ridden hard for two days and had had a particularly rough experience in getting through to our lines their names were j a campbell and a h rowland jr as campbell had the dispatch in his possession i told him to step into the mess-room with me and hand it to the general in person so as to comply literally with his instructions knowing the general's anxiety to have the news at once the message was written on tissue paper and enclosed in a ball of tinfoil which the scout had carried in his mouth the general glanced over it and then read it aloud to the party at the dinner-table it consisted of about three pages and gave a vivid account of sheridan's successful march and the irreparable damage he had inflicted upon the enemy's communications saying that he had captured twenty-eight pieces of artillery destroyed many wills and factories the james river canal for a distance of fifteen miles and the bridges on the ravana river and stating that he was going to destroy the canal still further the next day and then move on the central and the fredericksburg railroads tear them up and afterward march to white house where he would like to have forage and rations sent him and notifying the general that his purpose unless otherwise ordered was then to join the army of the potomac the general proceeded to interrogate campbell but the ladies who had now become intensely interested in the scout also began to ply him with questions which were directed at him so thick and fast that he soon found himself in the situation of the outstretched human figure in the almanac fired at with arrows from every sign of the zodiac the general soon rose from his seat and said good-naturedly well i will never get the information i want from this scout as long as you ladies have him under cross-examination and i think i had better take him over to my quarters and see if i cannot have him to myself for a little while by this time the dinner-party was pretty well broken up and by direction of the general several members of the staff accompanied him and the scouts to the general's quarters it was learned from them that sheridan deeming it very important to get a dispatch through to headquarters selected two parties consisting each of two scouts to each party was given a copy of the dispatch and each was left to select his own route campbell and roland started on horseback from columbia on the evening of the tenth following the roads on the north side of richmond they were twice overhauled by parties of the enemy but they represented themselves as belonging to imboden's cavalry and being in confederate uniforms and skilled in the southern dialect they escaped without detection when they approached the chickahominy they were met by two men and a boy with whom they fell into conversation and were told by them that they had better not cross the river as there were yankee troops on the other side before the scouts were out of earshot they heard one of the men say to the other i believe those fellows are damned yankees and soon they found that the alarm had been given and the confederate cavalry was pursuing them they rode forward to the chickahominy as rapidly as they could proceed in the jaded condition of their horses and when they reached the stream they took off everything except their undershirts tied their clothes on the pommels of their saddles and swam their horses across the river campbell had taken the roll of tinfoil which contained the dispatch from the lining of his boot and put it in his mouth on the other side of the stream they found a steep muddy bank and a row of piles 
as the horses could not struggle out the men abandoned them and got into a canoe which providentially happened to be floating past and by this means got ashore the confederates by this time had opened fire on them from the opposite bank the scouts made their way on foot for eleven miles in their almost naked condition to harrison's landing on the james river where they met a detachment of our troops the soldiers supplied them with trousers and blouses such as they could spare and took them by boat to city point they had ridden one hundred and forty-five miles without sleep and with but little food the second pair of scouts sent by sheridan made their way by canal and on foot to the south of richmond after six unsuccessful attempts to get across the lines one of them reached headquarters several days later the scouts were given a meal of the best food of which the headquarters mess could boast and put into a comfortable hut where they lost no time in making up for lost sleep the next day general grant made all preparation for sending supplies and troops to meet sheridan at white house the general complimented the scouts warmly upon their success directed that they should be supplied with two good horses and an outfit of clothing and sent them round to white house with a steamer to await sheridan there but on their arrival they could not restrain their spirit of adventure and rode out through the enemy's country in the direction of the south anna river until they met their commander campbell was only nineteen years of age sheridan always addressed him as boy and the history of his many hair-breadth escapes that year would fill a volume campbell has always remained a scout and is still in the employ of the government in that capacity at fort custer roland is now a prominent lawyer in pittsburgh pennsylvania this day march thirteen possesses a peculiar personal interest for me for the reason that it is the date borne by two brevet appointments i received one of colonel and the other of brigadier general in the regular army for gallant and meritorious services in the field during the rebellion End of chapter twenty five Chapter twenty six of Campaigning with Grant by Horace Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six Grant draws the net tighter around the enemy. President Lincoln's last visit to Grant. Grant's foresight. Attack on Fort Stedman. The President tells some anecdotes. Mr. Lincoln's kindness to animals. Sheridan's final orders. The President reviews the Army of the James sheridan reached white house on march nineteen after having made a campaign seldom equalled in activity through a difficult country and during incessant rains he had whipped the enemy at all points captured seventeen pieces of artillery and sixteen hundred prisoners and destroyed fifty-six canal locks five aqueducts twenty-three railroad bridges forty canal and road bridges together with forty miles of railroad numerous warehouses and factories and vast quantities of military supplies on march twenty stoneman advanced toward east tennessee and on the same day canby moved his forces against mobile sherman had whipped all the troops opposed to him in his march through the carolinas and destroyed communications in all directions he and schofield met with their armies at goldsboro north carolina on the twenty third of march and about all the points on the atlantic coast were now in our possession when sheridan started to join grant hancock had been put in command of the middle military division the various armies were all working successfully with a common purpose in view and under one watchful guiding mind the web was being woven closer and closer about the confederate capital and the cause of secession was every day drawing nearer to its doom general grant's only anxiety now was to prevent the escape of the enemy from richmond before he could be struck a crushing blow no campaign in force could be made at this time by moving around to the west of lee's army and heading it off in that direction for the reason that the rainy season still continued and rendered the roads difficult for infantry and impassable for wagons and artillery and because sheridan's cavalry had not yet joined our army in front of petersburg every possible precaution was taken meanwhile to prevent lee from withdrawing his army scouts and spies were more active than ever before 
about thirty thousand men were kept virtually on the picket line and all the troops were equipped and supplied ready to make a forced march at a moment's notice in case lee should be found moving it was now ascertained that sheridan could start from white house on march twenty five to join the army of the potomac and on the twenty fourth orders were issued for a general movement of the armies operating against petersburg and richmond to begin on the night of the twenty eighth for the purpose of marching around lee's right breaking up his last remaining railroads the danville and the south side and giving if possible the final blow to the confederacy on march twenty general grant had telegraphed the president can you not visit city point for a day or two i would like very much to see you and i think the rest would do you good this invitation was promptly accepted and on the twenty fourth word came that he was on his way up the james aboard the river queen about nine o'clock that evening the steamer approached the wharf and general grant with those of us who were with him at the moment including robert lincoln went down to the landing and met the president mrs lincoln and their youngest son tad and several ladies who had come from washington with the presidential party the meeting was very cordial it lasted but a short time however as mr lincoln and his family were evidently fatigued by the trip and it was thought that they might want to retire at an early hour his steamer was escorted by a naval vessel named the bat commanded by captain john s barnes an accomplished officer of the navy grant with his usual foresight had predicted that lee would make a determined assault at some point on our lines in an endeavor to throw our troops into confusion and then make his escape before our men could recover from their consternation and be prepared to follow him closely as early as february twenty two the general-in-chief sent a very characteristic dispatch to park who was temporarily in command of the army of the potomac during meade's absence as there is a possibility of an attack from the enemy at any time and especially an attempt to break your centre extra vigilance should be kept up both by the pickets and the troops on the line let commanders understand that no time is to be lost awaiting orders if an attack is made in bringing all their resources to the point of danger with proper alacrity in this respect i would have no objection to seeing the enemy get through on the evening of the twenty fourth of march general meade came to headquarters to meet mrs meade who had arrived by steamer at city point and general grant suggested to him that he had better remain over till the next day which he did general ord also stayed at headquarters that night about six o'clock the next morning march twenty five the camp was awakened and was soon all astir by reason of a message from the petersburg front saying that the enemy had broken through our lines near fort stedman and was making a heavy attack soon after it was found that the telegraph line had been broken and as messages would now have to come most of the distance by couriers there was increased anxiety as to the movement general grant saw at once that his prediction of a month before had been fulfilled but believed that the cautions given would be observed so that he did not experience much apprehension we had wakened him the moment the announcement came by rapping upon the door of the room occupied by him and mrs grant and in reply to his question the dispatch was read aloud enough for him to hear it without opening the door he dressed at once and as this was a process which never occupied many minutes he was soon out in front of his quarters where he was met by meade and others meade was greatly nettled by the fact that he was absent from his command at such a time and was pacing up and down with great strides and dictating orders to his chief of staff general webb who was with him in tones which showed very forcibly the intensity of his feelings the president who was aboard his boat anchored out in the river soon heard of the attack and he was kept informed of the events which were taking place by his son robert who carried the news to him general grant with his usual aggressiveness telegraphed to the army of the james this may be a signal for leaving be ready to take advantage of it it was nearly two hours before any very definite information could be obtained but the news began to be favourable and by half-past eight o'clock it was learned that our whole line had been recaptured many prisoners taken and that everything was again quiet mr lincoln now sent a telegram to the secretary of war winding up with the words 
robert just now tells me there was a little rumpus up the line this morning ending about where it began generals meade and ord returned as soon as they could to their respective commands and took vigorous measures against the enemy it seems that the richmond authorities had come to the conclusion that their position was no longer tenable and that their army must retreat as soon as possible a successful attack on our right it was hoped would throw our troops into confusion and while we were maturing plans for the recapture of the lost portion of our lines and drawing in troops from our left for this purpose lee would find an opportunity to make a forced march with his army toward the carolinas this attack was one of the most dramatic events of the siege of petersburg it was commanded by general j b gordon there had been placed at his disposal for the purpose about one half of lee's entire army for some time men had been leaving the ranks of the enemy and making their way to us through the lines at night the arms which they brought in were purchased from them at a fair price and everything possible was done to encourage these desertions the attacking party knowing of this practice took advantage of it and succeeded in having his skirmishers gain an entrance to our lines in the guise of deserters and suddenly make prisoners of our pickets just before dawn our trench guards were overpowered our main line was broken between two of our batteries and fort stedman after a brief but gallant resistance was captured and its guns turned against our own troops several more batteries to the right and left were soon taken and as friends could not be distinguished from foes owing to the darkness it was for a time difficult for our troops to use artillery further assaults however were handsomely repulsed as soon as there was sufficient light a heavy artillery fire was concentrated on the enemy and at a quarter to eight o'clock hartranff advanced towards fort stedman and recaptured it with comparatively little loss the movement was well planned and carried out with skill and boldness but it proved a signal failure it was a desperate military gamble with very few chances of winning it was a curious coincidence that on the same day that lee was preparing for his assault on our right grant was writing his orders for a general movement of the union armies against the enemy's right general grant proposed to the president that forenoon that he should accompany him on a trip to the petersburg front the invitation was promptly accepted and several hours were spent in visiting the troops who cheered the president enthusiastically he was greatly interested in looking at the prisoners who had been captured that morning and while at meade's headquarters about two o'clock sent a dispatch to stanton saying i have nothing to add to what general meade reports except that i have seen the prisoners myself and they look like there might be the number he states sixteen hundred the president carried a map with him which he took out of his pocket and examined several times he had the exact location of the troops marked on it and he exhibited a singularly accurate knowledge of the various positions upon the return to headquarters at city point he sat for a while by the campfire and as the smoke curled about his head during certain shiftings of the wind and he brushed it away from time to time by waving his right hand in front of his face he entertained the general-in-chief and several members of the staff by talking in a most interesting manner about public affairs and illustrating the subjects mentioned with his incomparable anecdotes at first his manner was grave and his language much more serious than usual he spoke of the appalling difficulties encountered by the administration the losses in the field the perplexing financial problems and the foreign complications but said they had all been overcome by the unswerving patriotism of the people the devotion of the loyal north and the superb fighting qualities of the troops after a while he spoke in a more cheerful vein and said england will live to regret her inimical attitude towards us after the collapse of the rebellion john bull will find that he has injured himself much more seriously than us his action reminds me of a barber in sangamon county in my state he had just gone to bed when a stranger came along and said he must be shaved that he had a four days beard on his face and was going to take a girl to a ball and that beard must come off 
well the barber got up reluctantly and dressed and seated the man in a chair with a back so low that every time he bore down on him he came near dislocating his victim's neck he began by lathering his face including his nose eyes and ears stropped his razor on his boot and then made a drive at the man's countenance as if he had practised mowing in a stubble field he cut a bold swath across the right cheek carrying away the beard a pimple and two warts the man in the chair ventured to remark you appear to make everything level as you go yes said the barber and if this handle don't break i guess i'll get away with most of what's there the man's cheeks were so hollow that the barber couldn't get down into the valleys with the razor and the ingenious idea occurred to him to stick his finger in the man's mouth and press out the cheeks finally he cut clear through the cheek and into his own finger he pulled the finger out of the man's mouth snapped the blood off it glared at him and cried there you lantern-jawed cuss you've made me cut my finger and so england will discover that she has got the south into a pretty bad scrape by trying to administer to her and in the end she will find that she has only cut her own finger after the laugh which followed this story had exhausted itself general grant asked mr president did you at any time doubt the final success of the cause never for a moment was the prompt and emphatic reply as mr lincoln leaned forward in his camp chair and enforced his words by a vigorous gesture of his right hand mr seward when he visited me last summer gave a very interesting account of the complications and embarrassments arising from the mason and slidell affair when those commissioners were captured on board the english vessel trent remarked general grant yes said the president seward studied up all the works ever written on international law and came to cabinet meetings loaded to the muzzle with the subject we gave due consideration to the case but at that critical period of the war it was soon decided to deliver up the prisoners it was a pretty bitter pill to swallow but i contented myself with believing that england's triumph in the matter would be short-lived and that after ending our war successfully we would be so powerful that we could call her to account for all the embarrassments she had inflicted upon us i felt a good deal like the sick man in illinois who was told he probably hadn't many days longer to live and he ought to make his peace with any enemies he might have he said the man he hated worst of all was a fellow named brown in the next village and he guessed he had better begin on him so brown was sent for and when he came the sick man began to say in a voice as meek as moses that he wanted to die at peace with all his fellow-creatures and he hoped he and brown could now shake hands and bury all their enmity the scene was becoming altogether too pathetic for brown who had to get out his handkerchief and wipe the gathering tears from his eyes it wasn't long before he melted and gave his hand to his neighbor and they had a regular love feast of forgiveness after a parting that would have softened the heart of a grindstone brown had about reached the room door when the sick man rose up on his elbow and called out to him but see here brown if i should happen to get well mind that old grudge stands so i thought that if this nation should happen to get well we might want that old grudge against england to stand it was a singular sequel to this conversation that the officer to whom he was then speaking became mr lincoln's successor in the presidential chair and carried out this determination by securing a settlement of the account known in history as the alabama claims and the payment from england of fifteen and a half millions of dollars as compensation for damages inflicted upon our commerce the president now went aboard his boat to spend the night the next morning he wandered into the tent of the headquarters telegraph operator where several of us were sitting he pulled out of his pocket a telegram which he had received from the secretary of war and his face assumed a broad smile as he said well the serious stanton is actually becoming facetious just listen to what he says in his dispatch your telegram and park's report of the scrimmage this morning are received the rebel rooster looks a little the worse as he could not hold the fence we have nothing new here now you are away everything is quiet and the tormentors vanished i hope you will remember general harrison's advice to his men at tippecanoe that they can see as well a little farther off three tiny kittens were crawling about the tent at the time 
the mother had died and the little wanderers were expressing their grief by mewing piteously mr lincoln picked them up took them in his lap stroked their soft fur and murmured poor little creatures don't cry you'll be taken good care of and turning to bowers said colonel i hope you will see that these poor little motherless waifs are given plenty of milk and treated kindly bowers replied i will see mr president that they are taken in charge by the cook of our mess and are well cared for several times during his stay mr lincoln was found fondling these kittens he would wipe their eyes tenderly with his handkerchief stroke their smooth coats and listen to them purring their gratitude to him it was a curious sight at an army headquarters upon the eve of a great military crisis in the nation's history to see the hand which had affixed the signature to the emancipation proclamation and had signed the commissions of all the heroic men who served the cause of the union from the general-in-chief to the lowest lieutenant tenderly caressing three stray kittens it well illustrated the kindness of the man's disposition and showed the childlike simplicity which was mingled with the grandeur of his nature general grant had sent word to sheridan whose troops were now crossing the james to come in person to headquarters and early on the morning of march twenty sixth he arrived rawlins and several other officers were in front of our quarters at the time and upon seeing sheridan who had been separated from us for so long a time we hurried forward to greet him rawlins in his enthusiasm seized both of sheridan's hands in his own wrung them vigorously and then went to patting him on the back sheridan returned all the greetings warmly and rawlins now informed him that general grant had made up his mind to send the cavalry through to join sherman destroying all communications as they went sheridan looked greatly annoyed at this information and rawlins agreed with him that such a move ought not to be made sheridan was told that the general-in-chief was awaiting him in his quarters and went in and had a long talk the general showed him the written instructions which he had prepared and to which rawlins had just referred they directed him to proceed with his cavalry around lee's right and then to move independently under other instructions sheridan felt convinced from what was said verbally that he was expected to cut loose and move down to sherman's army some of the staff now entered the room and found sheridan arguing against the policy of such a move when he rose up to go the general followed him out and had a few words of private conversation we learned afterward that he told sheridan that the part of the instructions to which he objected was merely a blind that he intended to end the contest at once where we were and that sheridan was to operate against lee's right and be in at the death he said in case the operations of the cavalry should not be an entire success the people would take it for granted that a definite movement which they had been expected had been a complete failure and they would be greatly discouraged so i wanted the impression to prevail that a different movement had been contemplated i really have no intention of sending you to sherman this was the general's little secret which he had kept from all the staff and revealed to the cavalry commander sheridan only at the last moment sheridan was made happy by this conversation and immediately told it to rawlins who was as much delighted as sheridan himself it was decided that upon this day mr lincoln would review a portion of the army of the james on the north side of the james river and sheridan was invited to join the party from headquarters who were to accompany the president the boat started from city point at eleven o'clock at breakfast general grant said to me i shall accompany the president who is to ride cincinnati as he seems to have taken a fancy to him i wish you would take mrs lincoln and mrs grant to the reviewing ground in our headquarters ambulance i expressed my pleasure at being selected for so pleasant a mission and arranged to have the ambulance and two good horses put aboard the headquarters boat which was to carry the party up the river captain barnes who commanded the vessel which had escorted the president's steamer was to be one of the party and i loaned him my horse this was a favor which was usually accorded with some reluctance to naval officers when they came ashore for these men of the ocean at times tried to board the animal on the starboard side and often rolled in the saddle as if there was a heavy sea on 
and if the horse in his anxiety to rid himself of a sea monster tried to scrape his rider off by rubbing against a tree the officer attributed the unseamanlike conduct of the animal entirely to the fact that his steering gear had become unshipped a naval hero not long before had borrowed a horse ashore and attempted to make his seat firmer on deck by grappling the animal's beam ends with his spurs which caused the horse to run a little too free before the wind and when the officer could not succeed in making him shorten sail by hauling in on the reins he took out his jack-knife and dug it in the animal's flanks swearing that if he could not bring the craft to in any other way he would scuttle it navy officers were about as reluctant to lend their boats to army people for fear they would knock holes in the bottom when jumping in breaking the oars and catching crabs and stave in the bows through an excess of modesty which manifested itself in a reluctance to give the command way enough in time when approaching a wharf the president was in a more gloomy mood than usual on the trip up the james he spoke with much seriousness about the situation and did not attempt to tell a single anecdote as the boat passed the point where sheridan's cavalry was crossing the river on the pontoon bridge he manifested considerable interest in watching the troopers and addressed a number of questions to their commander when the boat reached the landing on the north side of the river i helped the two distinguished ladies who had been entrusted to my care into the ambulance and started for the reviewing ground about two miles distant the horsemen got the start of us and made good time but as the road was swampy and part of it corduroyed with the trunks of small trees without much reference to their relative size or regularity of position the ambulance could make but slow progress some additional springs had been put under it and cross seats managed so as to make it ride more easily than the ordinary army ambulance but the improved springs only served to toss the occupants higher in the air when the wheels struck a particularly aggravating obstacle mrs lincoln finding we were losing time and fearing we would miss part of the review expressed a wish to move faster and i reluctantly gave the order to the driver we were still on a corduroyed portion of the road and when the horses trotted the mud flew in all directions and a sudden jolt lifted the party clear off the seats jammed the ladies hats against the top of the wagon and bumped their heads as well mrs lincoln now insisted on getting out and walking but as the mud was nearly hub deep mrs grant and i persuaded her that we had better stick to the wagon as our only ark of refuge finally we reached our destination but it was some minutes after the review had begun mrs ord and the wives of several of the officers who had come up from fort monroe for the purpose appeared on horseback as a mounted escort to mrs lincoln and mrs grant this added a special charm to the scene and the review passed off with peculiar brilliancy mrs grant enjoyed the day with great zest but mrs lincoln had suffered so much from the fatigue and annoyances of her overland trip that she was not in a mood to derive much pleasure from the occasion i made up my mind that ambulances viewed as vehicles for driving distinguished ladies to military reviews were not a stupendous success and that thereafter they had better be confined to their legitimate uses of transporting the wounded and attending funerals upon the return trip on the boat the president seemed to recover his spirits perhaps the manifestation of strength on the part of the splendid army of the james which he had witnessed at the review had served to cheer him up he told one excellent story on the way back in speaking of a prominent general and the failure of the numerous attempts on the president's part to make the officer's services useful to the country and the necessity finally of relieving him from all command he said i was not more successful than the blacksmith in our town in my boyhood days when he tried to put to a useful purpose a big piece of wrought iron that was in the shop he heated it put it on the anvil and said i'm going to make a sledge-hammer out of you after a while he stopped hammering it looked at it and remarked guess i've drawed you out a little too fine for a sledge-hammer reckon i'd better make a clevis of you he stuck it in the fire blew the bellows got up a good heat then began shaping the iron again on the anvil pretty soon he stopped sized it up with his eye and said guess i've drawed you out too thin for a clevis suppose i'd better make a clevis bolt of you 
he put it in the fire bore down still harder on the bellows drew out the iron and went to work at it once more on the anvil in a few minutes he stopped took a look and exclaimed well now i've got you down a leetle too thin even to make a clevis bolt out of you then he rammed it in the fire again threw his whole weight on the bellows got up a white heat on the iron jerked it out carried it in the tongs to the water barrel held it over the barrel and cried i've tried to make a sledgehammer of you and failed i've tried to make a clevis of you and failed i've tried to make a clevis bolt of you and failed now darn you i'm going to make a fizzle of you and with that he soused it in the water and let it fizz it was nearly dark when the party returned to city point after dinner the band was brought down to the steamboat and a dance was improvised several ladies were aboard and they and the officers danced till midnight neither the president nor general grant joined even in a square dance but sat in the after part of the boat conversing sheridan stayed overnight at city point and started early in the morning for the cavalry headquarters on the petersburg front End of chapter twenty six